Hi everyone, so excited to be here for another Care Connection today and very, very, you know, excited to also have Dr. Bershnick with us. She is an advanced fellow and speech language pathologist at the VA Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center in Durham, North Carolina. She also has a PhD in communication sciences and disorders from the University of South Florida and a master's in speech language pathology from Central Michigan University. Dr. Bershnick studies interventions for helping persons with dementia maintain cognitive and communication function through the use of compensatory strategies and care partner training. She also works on an interdisciplinary home care team at the Durham VA, providing speech pathology services for veterans with dementia and their care partners in the community. So welcome here today, and just housekeeping for everyone to know that you are on mute, but feel free to type in questions as we go along, um, and we'll have that at Q&A. So without further ado, Vanessa, welcome. Thank you, Kara. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today and to get to talk with all of you. Um, I hope some of the things we talk about today will be helpful, and I welcome any questions um, at the end of the presentation. All right, so on to the first slide. My objectives for you today are to be able to identify memory commun and communication strengths and challenges in dementia. Also recall at least one strategy for supporting communication in all forms in dementia. And as we'll talk about, communication is way more than just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, and also be able to discuss the role of speech language pathologists in helping people with dementia and their care partners. Okay, so let's start with communication and dementia. So we consider dementia to be a cognitive communication deficit. And the reason we make that distinction is because it is not a disorder that inherently affects our language system. So there's parts in the brain that control language, and there's other parts in the, in the brain that control attention, memory, and executive function. And for people with dementia, communication becomes impaired because of the deficits in those areas. And eventually along the course of the disease, other parts of, of communication are impacted, but this is primarily what we see. So this is just sort of a, a very simplified model of communication, what it takes for a, a thought to become a word. Um, and these are the various disorders that you could exhibit if you had, um, so for example, dementia, that's a cognitive disorder. Aphasia is caused by stroke um, or another brain injury to the language center of your brain, which is on the left side. Um, and then you have other disorders called apraxia and dysarthria, and those are more associated with motor planning, motor execution. Um, those types of disorders, we see them in things like ALS. Um, and so there are these different parts of communication. So we have the thought and, and what we want to say, the memory of words, and what words mean certain things. And then we have our knowledge of the language. And that is our ability to assign sounds, grammar, um, you know, words to indicate meaning. And then, of course, the later parts, which are the more motor and execution parts. So in dementia, the deficits we see are more associated with the memory of words. And we've learned through research that if we can use cues to support the person's memory of the word, um, it helps them speak more fluently. So I'm going to go through some challenges and strengths that people have in terms of their cognition and communication in dementia. And this is mainly for learning. I, I really, as a clinician and a researcher, I really do not get caught up in the stages of dementia. And that is because a person with quote unquote severe dementia can have a variety of differences compared to another person with severe dementia. So there are a variety of, of variation in between. So, um, you know, just kind of think of this as a learning exercise. It's not cut and dry when I talk about mild, moderate, and severe. So in general, what we see are, uh, in early dementia, are challenges word finding, maybe difficulties compre comprehending abstract language, um, following complex conversations. We might see challenges with attention, which of course um, causes difficulties with following conversation. Um, and memory for names and places may start to decline. 
for strengths in terms of speaking, you know, it's it's fairly preserved at this stage. So we're not really seeing any any overt deficits in that area. Um, they can, you know, comprehend concrete language. Reading and writing is typically preserved. Also, a person with mild is typically aware of their memory lapses. So, you know, as speech language pathologists, this is a great time to intervene because we can start working with the person on strategies to help them maintain a certain level of function um, of their memory by using certain strategies. In moderate dementia, we start to see maybe more of what's called nonspecific or empty speech. Um, things like, you know, saying uh, the thing over there instead of saying an actual word for what that thing is. So, you know, lacking sort of the, the content. Um, we start to see greater impairments in short term memory. Topic maintenance becomes impaired in a conversation. So they might, you know, shift the topic or go back to a previous topic difficulty comprehending multi-step directions, they may express delusions or anxious thoughts. Um, we might see some social withdrawal at this time, and that could be due to some of the communication challenges. And again, strength, still, still speech sounds and grammar are relatively preserved. Um, simple reading and writing can be preserved. Recognition of familiar persons, places, an automatic and procedural memory. And so what, what those last two are, the procedural memory, it's essentially the same thing. Um, that's your memory for behaviors. So we have two different types. We have this sort of what's called declarative memory and non-declarative. Declarative is that active retrieval of, of sort of facts and information. So remembering like the 50 states or the capitals. Um, and procedural memory is you can, maybe you can, navigate to the bathroom without you know having to really think about it it's it's almost the thing that happens when we we drive somewhere and we don't remember how we got there it's very automatic um and that is what contributes to to reading being preserved because reading is a very automatic process it's something we don't have to think about once we learn we've kind of learned it um, and so you'll notice as i go through the the other slides that this is something we capitalize on a lot in our interventions Severe dementia. So this is when we really see um, decline in verbal communication. The person may have limited or unintelligible verbal expression, repetitive vocal and physical behavior, uh, limited auditory comprehension. However, strengths we see are appropriate responses to sensory stimuli. So if you smile at them, they might smile back. Uh, maybe hand massages, they respond appropriately to those kinds of things. Um, cooperation with the appropriate cues, tactile, visual, effective, and a desire for social connection. So, you know, what we know about individuals with dementia is that they really do maintain the sense of personhood throughout the disease and that those basic human needs um, do, not, do not go away. So all that said, conversation can be impaired by a variety of things. So not only do we have a person with a degenerative disorder of the brain, but we also have an aging individual. So this can cause difficulties with sensory abilities, um, hearing and vision. And due to the dementia, we can have difficulties word finding. We might see some perseveration. They might repeat questions or repeat words or statements they say. Um, empty speech, they might lack some content, and we might see some errors. So they may say the wrong things or, or um, not exactly be able to report their life history accurately, things like that. And as I said before, people with dementia still desire to socialize, express their ideas, participate in hobbies, interact with family, be included in activities, and teach and learn. So what our job is as, as care partners and professionals is, is to um, help the individual in doing very human things and what they want to do to the extent possible throughout the disease. And I'm going to talk about how. So, you know, the technical term for what I'm going to describe is memory communication aids or external aids, they're called. But what you can think of them as are cognitive ramps. So people in wheelchairs, we we provide ramps for them to be able to access buildings. 
Um, and these aids that I'm going to show you are what we consider cognitive ramps because they enable access and participation in the person's environment. So areas we will see these in are, are situations for communication with self and others. And what I mean by self is, you know, an individual with dementia may forget where they live. They may forget um, who is around them, how they got to where they are. And so we can kind of facilitate that. Um, orientation to the environment. So finding things, uh, knowing the date, knowing the people in their environment and um, participation in activities. So I want to start with specifically communication with self and others. One of the most researched interventions in terms of communication uh, for dementia is memory books. And what these are are just simply photo albums with um, maybe one or two or just a few pictures on each page and a declarative sentence. So you can see things like, um, I was born October 16, 1939 in Chicago. Um, and so they're facts in written and picture format. They're tailored to the person and it re represents just whatever is meaningful and whatever events are meaningful to that person. Memory books can be in a variety of topics. So they could be um, different life events like a life story in uh, consecutive order and they could be about family or friends. You could have a book that's just people um, so that the person could remember who is who. Um, they could be about a vacation. They could be about a hobby. And you can also use them to address any challenging behaviors. So for example, a person who is unable to recall that their wife has passed away. Um, you know, you can do something very obvious, like a page um, in the top left that says, my wife Jane lost her valiant fight with cancer on May 10th and rests peacefully here. Um, or you can do more subtle things such as, you know, me and my wife had a beautiful life together or, you know, sort of the, that past tense communication um, to indicate where the person is in their life and, you know, where other in individuals are as well. The top right example is a little bit difficult to see, but it says my boys live far away, so I don't get to see them very often. I look forward to spending special occasions together. And this page of a memory book was created for an individual who um, would ask his wife every night when they went down to, to dinner, they lived in an assisted living facility, um, she, he would say, are the boys joining us or where are the boys? And so she used this page in the memory book to address that they're not joining us, but we will see them eventually. And the key here is that with these difficult topics to be positive and to try to frame it in a positive and comforting way to the person. We don't want to just say your wife is dead. We want to say she rests peacefully or, you know, we had a beautiful life together, things along that line. And there are some individuals who, um, you know, maybe have low vision or I, for the first time this year, I, I treated an, a person who never learned to read. So, so this can be, you know, a barrier to using a memory book. So I might encourage in this case to use um, more tangible items. So you could have a memory box that has familiar um, things the person can look at and, and um, be able to feel and just trigger those um, preserved long-term memories in that way. Another intervention is called reminder cards. And these are simply a written cue that serves to either solve a problem, answer a question, provide reassurance, or just support memory in, in some other way. Um, the reason we use these are that, you know, it's, it's very easy to want to say, for example, you have a person that asks you repetitive questions, which is very, um, this is what essentially reminder cards were developed for. What happens in dementia is we have a short term memory impairment, right? So, so saying something to the person is not going to be retained for very long. So what this reminder card does is help to keep that information in mind. And with repetition, the person can learn to rely on the card uh, versus you. So these are just some examples. Uh, the one to the immediate right says, I am at the Durham VA Medical Center. I'm here to receive medical care. This was developed for veterans who go to the ER and, and don't recall how they got there. Um, I'm working with the ER staff right now on implementing these. 
Um, you might have individuals who maybe don't want to take their medication, so we can give them a reminder that they take their pills to feel better. Um, different things like plans for the day. I'm taking you to church. We're going to Roses for lunch. So whatever question the person has, um, you can use the reminder cards for those. And here are just some steps. So first, you're going to state the answer to the question or concern. You're going to write the answer on a card or a notepad. Read the card out loud with the person and give it to him or her. And when the question is repeated, instead of saying the answer, you direct the person to the cards. You're going to say, read the card or, hmm, I think the answer to that question is on your card. And that is kind of a subtle way to say it if you don't feel comfortable just saying, read the card. Um, and you're going to do this each time the question is repeated. And what that does is it reinforces it. And the more repetition, the more likely the, the person is to learn to use the card versus you for that information. And here are just some helpful hints. It's important to have a clear message on the card. Large print is, is likely the best. Um, a few simple and positive words. Um, some people, you know, it's kind of intuitive to think that like, oh, large print, let me write it in all caps. But really, normal sentence case, as much as you can normalize the message, um, is going to be easier for, for the person with dementia to read. Um, you're going to want to make it personal. So as you saw in those previous examples, I'll flip back to, it says, I am taking you to church today. We are going to get ice cream. Um, John will call, I probably should say me at noon. Um, so using personal pronouns, I, my, we, uh, in the message. And then, of course, read the message aloud and just make sure it's clear. And Read it, reading it with the person will also help you make sure it's clear. And these are just a few specific examples. So a person says, I need to find my wife. We could provide a reminder card that says, Francis knows I'm here, she will call me at noon. Uh, we had a, a veteran in the, the VA who didn't want to eat in the hospital because he didn't have any money and he didn't understand that um, you know, his, the meals are paid for. You don't need to have money to pay to eat as a hospital patient. And so we developed reminder cards that said my meals are paid for. In other situations, you could use something like a meal voucher so that the person can, you know, maybe they want to exchange it for the meal or feel like they're paying or it's just a sort of external evidence that your meals are paid for. Everything's covered. Uh, and this is just sort of a, a creative alternative to reminder cards, and they're called pseudo letters. Um, and uh, they can be used for a variety of purposes. I'll explain the one on the left. Um, my fiance is a resident in uh, a Tampa General Hospital, and when he was a medical student, he had a patient on one of his rotations that had been admitted because he got lost and was in a parking lot in a in a McDonald's, and his the cops found him and, and brought him in and, you know, he was confused and um, he, the, the, the truck he had was left at the McDonald's. So this man was, was demanding to figure out where his car was. He was concerned about it. He was banging on the nurse's station and just couldn't relax until he knew where his, his car was. Um, and so what I helped my fiance to do was create a pseudo letter for this individual and it was extremely effective. Um, and so this is essentially just a letter from the police to say your your vehicle is fine. You know, um, your doctors will inform you if anything changes with regards to your vehicle. So all true information, um, but provided from the medical staff, this person just wasn't trustworthy of that. And that's pretty typical of people with dementia. You know, they they have a, a, a disease that impairs their memory, you know, they're suspicious of a lot of things, they feel insecure about things. Um, and so we can help them with these kinds of um, supportive aids to kind of ease their anxiety around these issues. Okay, so this is um, specifically where my research lands is uh, preference communication. And um, Essentially, what I've developed is uh, picture supports for 
Uh, and it, we're still researching them so that they're not in a sort of uh, purchasable or downloadable format yet, but I'm working with the um, preference-based living team that I'll talk about later um, to develop those. Um, but you can also make them yourself. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, preference-based living, uh, if, if there are any nursing home providers here, uh, they have a questionnaire called the PELI, the Preferences for Everyday Living Inventory, and that coincides with some MDS items. So you could use that when completing the MDS. But all that to say that those um, preference questions can be supported by pictures. And what the research shows us is that you know, pictures can help support comprehension and we can also reliably assess preferences using picture support. So um, essentially what that involves is using these cue cards to the right and a sorting map. And so, you know, you could have the person sort the activities into important, somewhat important, not important, or um, always, sometimes, never. For individuals who maybe are a little bit more impaired, I would suggest just two choices important, not important, thumbs up, thumbs down, um, and that will decrease the complexity of the task. Or you can just present them and show them to the person and, and say, what do you think about pet care? Do you like watching TV? You can ask yes, no questions too and support them with a picture. So they are, these cards can be very helpful topic cues um, and you know, don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. I use PowerPoint to create mine, so. And just in general, you know, speaking of memory strategies, uh, a strategy that we use for people that don't have dementia are mnemonics. So uh, um, Smith and colleagues in 2011 developed the message strategies for communication, which are based off um, a review of literature of supportive strategies. And essentially what that starts with is maximizing attention. So we want to make sure our environment is optimal for communication. Um, reducing distractions, getting the person's attention, speaking face to face, um, you know, not yelling across the hall and expecting the person to understand or attend. Um, watching your expression and body language. People with dementia can mirror our body language. So try to remain relaxed and calm. And if the person is having trouble communicating, still show interest and encourage them um, to keep the conversation flowing. Uh, keep it simple, short, simple, and familiar. Create clear choices. Would you like to wear this white shirt or this blue shirt? Would you like the chicken or the fish? Um, support conversation, giving time, allowing them to find the word. You can ask permission for, you know, can I, can I guess what you're trying to say? Um, repeat, then rephrase. Uh, you know, if the person says something that's kind of unintelligible or hard to understand, you can say, oh, so you meant this or, or you're asking about this and kind of verify with them. Um, you can remind the person of the topic. And, and what I like to do in conversation is create clear transitions, because when I'm interviewing an individual, I might need to shift a topic. So I'll say, you know, OK, so we talked about your career, but now I want to know about your family. What can you tell me about your family? So sort of clear transitions and reminders of the topic. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, assist with visual aids, gestures and actions, objects and pictures. Um, you know, I'm gonna take you to the bathroom and gesture towards the bathroom. Uh, get their message, make sure you're listening, watching, uh, look for behavioral and nonverbal messages as communication declines, we see uh, we see behavior become communication. So keep that in mind. Um, encourage and engage. Use topics that are familiar to the person. Um, talk about family and friends, whatever that person is interested in. Uh, these are just some tips of where to, where to start. And this likely will not apply to our family caregivers because you've been talking to that person for a very long time. But um, for maybe any professional caregivers on the call, um, you know, saying hello, introducing yourself, noticing something about the person, starting to build that rapport is very important. Avoid any questions that require recall. So who visited you today? Or what's your wife's name? Or, you know, what's, what's her name? Those kind of quizzing questions are things we want to avoid because obviously that's, that's calling on a system that is impaired with this disease. So if possible, you know, using a visual or I saw that your wife visited you today. 
Um, did you have fun with her or things like that? Um, if the person gets stuck when having a conversation, reassure them and, and, and maybe move on or try to get um, other information about the topic. All right, so now we're gonna talk about orientation to the environment. And so communication is more than just conversation, right? Communication, as far as I see it, is, is communicating with your environment too and knowing where to go and, and how to get there and what time it is and, and what does what in your environment. So these aids that I'm gonna go through are, are gonna support those things. All right, so first step is wayfinding, and that essentially is just like finding your way around your environment. And what we've learned is that high contrast signage helps people with dementia find their way around. Um, this is especially important in environments maybe where they're new to, like a residential facility. Um, and, you know, it could be maybe in a home that they move to later in their life, so they, they're not as familiar with it. Um, and, you know, what's important, and again, like I've created these on PowerPoint, it doesn't have to be uh, a very technical process. Um, it can help to have a picture, an icon to support uh, the person. So we have a picture of the person, we have a picture of uh, a soup bowl for the dining room, different things that maybe symbolize activities or like a toilet for the bathroom. The next cue is going to be for orientation. So I'm sure many people have heard of these. These are, you know, clocks, um, a whiteboard, something that lists really everything the person would have to know to be oriented to the time and the date and the year. Things like calendars. Um, what can be helpful is to use large clear clocks. This one on the far left here can be on Amazon. It's, very, it's one of my favorites, and I, I like to order it for our veterans um, because it's, it can be harder to see those analog clocks, so that's, that's why. Um, and you could create a memory station, say, on your kitchen counter, and you can have the to-do list for the day, um, a calendar, and your clock that says the date um, and the time. So these are all just ways of supporting orientation to time. Organizational cues. So with dementia and also with age, our ability to see and see contrast becomes more difficult and more challenged. And so what's important is to decrease clutter to the extent possible. And you can increase the clarity of things around the person by adding labels. So you know, for someone with a vision challenge, it might be hard to see sort of um, smaller print. So you could, you know, in that case, it might be really um, easy to mix up lotion and soap. And um, you might mix up toothpaste with something. And, and so really clear labels decluttering the environment can help the person to maximize their function. Other organizational cues, labeling drawers, um, providing instructions on on areas of the home, um, labeling the trash and recycling, and you can further enhance that by adding different colors. So you could make the trash blue and recycling green or something along those lines. All of these help with comprehension and organization and sort of associating um, that these things are different categories. Another thing is name tags. You know, we can all remember or think about a time when we forgot someone's name and how embarrassing that is um, and how it can kind of affect your ability to connect with that person because so, you're just kind of trying to remember what their name is. So if we can, you know, sort of get in front of that barrier to a person with dementia by wearing a name tag um, and I've, I've visited a, a nursing home where the staff and the residents were name tags and I just thought that that was so great because of course the residents have to know each other's names it's not just the staff that have you have to know their name um, so the staff would have their sort of required medical badge but then they would have a dementia friendly name tag that said um, just their first name and these can be created really easily um, as well and, and the residents had a routine of you know putting their badge on a on a wall every evening so they didn't get lost Okay, so now we're gonna talk about activity participation, and that includes different visuals and supports for activities. 
So these are just a couple examples of using visuals and text to support activities. And the technical term is called visual sequencing aids. Um, it's just a visual list of instructions. And so this one on the left is a getting dressed uh, checklist. And I created this for a veteran who he had to take his um, hearing, hearing aids out when the shower was, uh, when he was in the shower. And so, you know, getting dressed, it was, it was just a whole issue. And then also the short term memory impairment. Um, and so what I did is I asked him and his wife, what is the routine that you go through? Some people put their socks on before their underwear. So you really have to customize it to that person's routine. Um, so this was his, and, and this is the, the checklist that we established that, so that his wife didn't have to keep repeating herself for the, um, the process of getting dressed. Uh, this item to the right is instructions for doing a fall leaf craft. And this comes from uh, when I was at University of South Florida, I co-founded an organization called Forever Friends, which is a, kind of like best buddies, but with um, nursing home residents and college students. So they would pair up once a month and do an activity. And we had some individuals who had cognitive impairment. So we um, developed a visual aid for those people. And truth of the matter is these aids help everybody. So it just doesn't hurt to have them. Um, and so it's just simple instructions with, with visual cues. The trick is to be clear and concise. Um, this example comes from the Aphasia Institute because for people who have aphasia, the a language disorder from stroke, many of the interventions we use for dementia are also helpful. So just clear text with visual supports, um, bold, lots of white space, um, you know, nothing, nothing too complex here. Okay, so these examples are what I call invitational signage. And so we know that in dementia, uh, initiation can be compare, uh, impaired and we maybe start to see some apathy and disengagement. And what these little signs do are, are to invite the person that, hey, you can help us out with this or you can do this. Um, you know, this is a, this, these examples come from a long-term care setting, however, ter perfectly applicable in the home as well. The, the one on the far left says, please help put the groceries away in the cupboard. And so, you know, the person could put the cans in the cupboard and then the staff would come around and sort of undo the activity so that someone else could come around and do it. Um, the middle one says, please help arrange the flowers. And the one on the right says, please help fold the clothes or please fold the clothes. And these are just some general steps for creating and implementing activities. Of course, knowing the person, which won't be hard for a lot of you family caregivers. Um, preparing the environment, as I mentioned before, limiting distraction, adding those supportive cues, adding the visual aids, inviting the person, right? Encouraging that it's a choice. Would you like to fold the clothes with me? Would you like to do this? Um, demonstrating the steps. Often demonstrating can be more powerful than providing uh, a verbal um, instruction because of those impairments to short-term memory and auditory comprehension that I talked about earlier. So showing the person what you'd like to do. You put, you know, you put this here, kind of just demonstrating for them and allow them to try it next. And then step back and observe. If the person's engaged and they're happy, we don't have to correct them. They don't have to do the, the activity to 100% um, accuracy. If they are happy and engaged, we can encourage that. Um, and then when the activity is done, you can praise and thank the person. So thank you for doing that with me. Would you like to do that again sometime? And I use that last question as sort of a, an evaluation of if they liked it. And some will say, no, that's okay. And then I know that they were just kind of entertaining me um, and didn't really want to do it. but. Uh, you know, often if it's an activity that they've, uh, that is personalized to them and uh, person-centered, then they will want to do, do it again. And this again comes from Smith and colleagues, um, just some kind of to bring it all together, some general strategies for supporting memory activity and engagement. Um, you know, those reminders, particularly powerful are the written word and picture reminders. 
Um, having a permanent, in the environment, having a permanent place for objects and not changing the surroundings as much as possible. Creating cons consistent routines. Keep up anything that's familiar. Um, you know, this is, this is kind of consistent with what we call, you know, is commonly referred to as those sundowning behaviors. When in reality, it's kind of a natural response to what has always been a shift in the person's life. So if we're starting to see, you know, the restlessness around the afternoon or, or evening time, we can think about like, okay, in this person's life, how is their routine changed around that time every day? And how can we maybe create sort of an engaging activity or something that, that helps meet that need for routine? Um, you know, again, attention, avoiding distractions, help the person focus. Cognitive impairment limits our ability to weed out those things that are distracting, like those noises and, and things going on around us and impairs our ability to focus. So we have to be able to support that. Um, practice. So, you know, maintaining skills through use, practice new skills. I say this all the time with activities is, keep trying and, and even with memory aids, keep trying and don't give up on the first try because what we know about practice and repetition is that it enhances learning. So we need to be able to implement that repetition if we want to help the person get used to maybe this new thing we're trying or, or this um, activity we're trying. Break things into steps and allow the person time to acclimate and process. Okay. So inevitably, you know, it's, it's great for me to show you guys things, but they don't always work 100% of the time right off the bat. So here are just some tips that I've come up with in terms of troubleshooting and problem solving. Um, are there any vision challenges? If we're creating a visual aid, can we increase the contrast or the text size? And I'll show you some slides um, to, to explain that further. Uh, is the message too long or complex? Does uh, it need a color image to support association? So think about those wayfinding cues. And if the person is unable to notice that the bathroom is there with just a text sign, maybe we should add a picture. Or um, a good example is identifying someone's room. So if they're not unable to recognize that older picture of themselves, maybe we can pair that older picture with a younger picture. Um, to show the person that this is who this room is for. Is there an unmet need that may be causing a responsive behavior? So when I think about repetitive questions, you know, it, it can sometimes be more than just information seeking. So I had a particular case where the veteran would ask repetitive questions about when's my doctor's appointment? When when is this thing? When are when are John and Kathy coming over? And it was on particularly, it was on days when he was more bored or, um, uh, you know, disengaged and maybe his wife was busy doing something in the office. So what we learned from this was that his questions were less about wanting to know that information and more about needing connection with his wife. And, and so we figured out various strategies um, to help increase that connection so that he wasn't um, needing you know, that, that connection through the repetitive questions. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, repetition and consistency support learning. So don't try one time and give up if things aren't successful. Um, think about pairing something with an already established routine. Particularly, this helps with memory aids. So if you want to review the calendar, try to pair that with drinking your coffee or some, some routine that you both engage in or the person engages in on a regular basis so that you can kind of pair that with the time that you're sitting down, there's less distractions, um, and, it, and you can kind of sneak it in the person's daily routine. Um, and to the extent possible, incorporate the person in the design. Um, you know, if I'm writing a written reminder, I will try to, I will, if I'm able to, I will try to ask the person, like, what do you think this should say? Um, an example I'm thinking about is, when I had a veteran who was overwatering his plants. Um, and his wife was very frustrated by that, that he was overwatering the plants. And so I said, let's let's create a reminder to help you remember when you've already watered the plants. Like, do you think it should say, do not water the plants? Or do you think it should say, 
I already watered this, uh, watered, not watered. We went through a, a variety of options and I let him choose and that was very effective. And so the more personalized you can make the support, the better. Okay, and these are those examples that I mentioned about um, assessing sort of text size and contrast. Um, they come from the Environmental Communication Assessment Toolkit developed by um, Jennifer Brush and colleagues. And you don't have to use these exact ones. You could use a newspaper if you wanted to assess the person's ability to read text sizes. Um, but these are just examples of, you know, text size variation and also contrast variation. And just some general points to remember. So the person with dementia is trying to make sense of their environment. They might be embarrassed or scared or frustrated. They're not trying to forget information to try to annoy you or on purpose. They may not be aware of their own actions or behaviors. And this person is an adult with a lifetime of experiences and adult desires and needs. Um, and also give yourself grace too. We can't pour from an empty cup, so it's very important. Um, to support ourselves, which I'm sure that is gone over a lot in these uh, Care Connection webinars. And finally, just want to give a plug for speech language pathologists. We have a primary role in the screening and assessment, diagnosis and treatment and research of cognitive communication disorders, um, including those associated with dementia. And so, you know, what you would experience potentially in a session or an interview, understanding the person, their needs and challenges, standardized and non-standardized assessments, uh, assessments that would identify the person's cueing needs and the levels of support that they need, what helps them, um, collaboration and consultation to develop memory and communication aids, training for the person as well as the care partner, because as dementia progresses, we speech pathologists rely heavily on the care partner to be able to help the person implement those aids. My goal as a speech pathologist is to help people with dementia spend their day doing what they want to do to the extent possible. I want to empower care partners and help them meet their goals too and help the person fill their days with familiar routines and with people and sometimes animals that they enjoy and be able to maximize self-esteem and minimize the unexpected. So with that, thank you all so much for listening. My email if you if you ever have any questions or um, I, I'm, I know they're sharing this handout, um, so you won't need that from me, but my email is vanessa.berchnick at duke.edu, and these are my references. And lastly, I just want to recommend some resources, and I these, these books over here, I don't receive any royalties from recommending them. I, I genuinely use them in my clinical practice, um, memory and communication aids for people with dementia. My mentor is actually the author. My PhD mentor is the author. Um, she is a pioneer researcher in this field. Um, and then for activities, Montessori for Elder and Dementia Care uh, by Jennifer Bresch is an extremely helpful book and has a ton of um, great suggestions and pictures and guidance for anyone who wants to create activities for people with dementia um, that are age appropriate and appropriate for their level. Um, of cognition and this one on the right is just a tip sheet for communication support. Um, I developed this with the preference-based living team. It's completely free online as well as a ton of other resources on their website and you can find it at preferencebasedliving.com slash tip sheets um, and we developed this for both people with dementia and those with other communication disorders like aphasia. So if you need something for your staff or for yourself or for your um, just care partners you work with, I highly recommend checking that out. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And, you know, I'm just gonna take this time that for those of you who are with us, you know, if you have questions and things, Vanessa, Dr. Bershnick and Vanessa, right, is here to be with us today yeah. to answer any questions that are coming up. And I first wanna, you know, say, I think it's so important what you do because you're really including the person in their life while they're living with this disease, very person-centered approach and really showing that compassion and independence that is still possible when someone has this disease. Um, and I'm just getting so many thank yous that are, are coming in. So I'm gonna yeah. start with some of the questions we have 
of course. Um, someone first asking, is there any suggestions for coping with reduced vocal ability? And I know we kind of touched on that through some of the different um, cueing options you had. Yeah, reduced vocal ability. So it makes me wonder if it's due to dementia or something else. If the per mm -hmm. person is just talking quietly, um, there are a couple things. A, a sort of high tech solution would be there are, and I don't think they're very expensive, but there are little mm -hmm. microphones that have uh, a small kind of speaker attached to them that I know they use for individuals who have like Parkinson's and ALS and who have trouble amplifying their voice. So if you had an individual with that, that could be a helpful tool. Um, another is just leaning on those sort of nonverbal um, cues that I talked about earlier and creating, maybe you create a communication book um, that the person, you know, has specific topics and content that they want to talk about and that is their little booklet that they carry around with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it's gonna be it's gonna be individualistic per the person to see. Mm -hmm. I have another person who asked, um, Dr. Bershnik, do you have any advice for how to handle pushback or resistance if the person with the diagnosis um, thinks the activity might seem silly to them? Mm. Um yeah, I mean I I would there are a variety of things that come to mind. So first of all, I would I would try to understand why they think that. Um, and if it's valid, you know, I, I'm thinking about maybe someone who was an artist their whole life and now they're being asked to color with crayons. That could be insulting, you know? And mm -hmm. so what I would turn to are more familiar materials and something that acknowledges this person's expertise and their um, background. Um, I, this is not from my own practice, but it comes from a story from someone in long-term care shared with me. They had an individual who was very much not about activity. She wanted to be the, um, she had a special name tag that like gave, she was the helper. So she got to pass out the materials to other residents and like she wanted that distinguishment. So maybe you give them a different role in the activity that allows them to facilitate. Um, Another idea, <laughs> there was a resident who didn't like any activity. She didn't want to play bingo. You know, she was above that. And they started handing out these physical invitations for the activities. And that, for some reason, made all the difference to her. And so she got her invitation and she brought her invitation to the room and just felt like, I received my invitation. I'm So, you know, we just have to think about who the person is and what what identifies with their, I mean, quite frankly, their ego and what acknowledges, you know, from our perspective to them, who they are and, and the qualifications, quote unquote, that they have and, and how can we work with that? Mm -hmm. And I really like that because you're looking at that person as they're the expert of their life. So, and if they're still in a position where they can help facilitate in some way, why not have them included and in joining in that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So I do have another person with a question. Um, she, she asked, um, Dr. Bershnik, can you speak about any common safety measures when you're working with someone to protect um, those with dementia? Hmm. I guess I would want to know what we're talking about. What specifically? Um, yeah. I can give you an example that I had per, that actually mm -hmm. have come up on the, the helpline was um, someone, you know, Mick, they um, misunderstood looking at a water bottle with actually a chemical for cleaning. Yeah, um, yeah. And that was something they, they asked about. So that could be an example of, you know, how do we kind of address safety measures maybe in that scenario? Yeah. So honestly, what I and, you know, the, the common instinct, I think, in our especially in the long-term care environment where we're focused on risk and, and liability is to, we need to lock the cabinets and prevent the person from accessing yeah. those things. Um, you know, my instinct would be to, you know, what if the person with cleaning is a very important thing to them and, and contributes to their self-esteem? Um, I would not want to take that away from the person. Instead, I might be inclined to use a safer product. So something with a vinegar base, um, there's a lot of organic products out there right now that are, are perfectly safe. Um, 
So considering some of those things, as well as the labels um, that I talked about earlier, you can add something more in depth that, you know, says do not drink or cleaning only, things like that. Um, you know, I, an example from, so I used to be an activities assistant in a nursing home and that's kind of how I got interested in elder care and dementia, um, or care of older adults and dementia. Um, and I made the mistake of putting paint on plates one time and I turned around and I, this woman who couldn't speak, um, she was at the table and she had paint. Luckily it was safe paint, but it was like all in her mouth. And I was like, oh, that was my, totally my fault. Because if you put paint on a plate, that could easily be mistaken for food. Um, so, yeah, you know, definitely. You think about the materials we use. Um, it, it's interesting. If you really want to challenge your perspective of dementia, I would highly recommend looking up Montessori Google, on YouTube. Look up Montessori for Dementia Australia, and you will see these nursing homes where people with dementia are cutting vegetables, um, they're helping serve each other, they're accessing food on their own, um, they're watering the grass, they're taking out the trash. They, they're, uh, it's, it's really informed by like a Montessori philosophy for dementia. Um, but these are, you know, what happens is they have these preserved skills. And so if you are a chef, your likelihood of not being good with a knife as you're older is, is very low because that's a procedural skill that you can do without thinking, um, you know, and there are adaptations for vision challenges and things like that. But I would highly recommend checking out those videos. They're very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I like that approach because uh, I think many times in this disease, many people might try to restrict or restrain um, and the person obviously doesn't know that they're doing something wrong or right. They're just, you know, going about their day. Right. Yeah. And it gives them purpose. Right. So we have to feel yeah. if we're going to take something away, we have to figure out how we can replace it. We can't just take away. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if someone who who asked, you know, how do you handle um, communication when dealing with resistance to personal care or bathing? Yeah, so, so common. Um, you know, again, I would just kind of try to put yourself in the position of that person. Mm -hmm. Being naked and showered and vulnerable, I was asked to consult on a, uh, you know, a, a similar case and, and challenge. And the CNA said, can you come just observe the interaction? And I was like, oh my goodness. First she went to the bathroom and then she was in the shower. And I was just like, both of these are very embarrassing and, and difficult situations to be in. And I, you know, it would make sense to me why a person is defensive, especially if they didn't understand the, um, what was going on. And, and what I particularly observed in this interaction and is not always the case is that the, there was, no positive communication coming from the the aid it was it was you know sit down don't touch that it, very directive so we have to monitor our tone um as well as just thinking about what was this person's routine uh before they had dementia so did they always shower at night did they prefer to shower in the morning uh did they shower at all quite frankly or did they bathe uh, or you know sit in a tub um, you know, can we get them involved in the interaction? If, if give them a washcloth, let, allow them to help. Mm -hmm. um, you know, can we use a reminder card that says uh, showering makes me feel fresh and clean? And you can provide that to them and say, OK, are you ready for your shower now? And just kind of trying to ease into the interaction and and putting yourself in their place as a vulnerable person who's naked and maybe doesn't understand who you are and trying to begin with um, rapport building and, and easing into the, into the interaction. And I know, you know, it's very common and there are, there are also things to consider like, is the bathroom, and this is the more difficult thing to change. So I say it last, but you know, there was a case, a colleague shared this with me where a person had been, um, was in the Holocaust and the showers reminded her of the gas chambers. And so they had to 
uh, modify and create a, put a mural on the wall because otherwise she would not shower, understandably. Um, and so just, just certain things you should just think about. Of, is there anything in their environment or about, about them as a person that could be triggering a negative response? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we do have some, uh, a few questions spe specifically pertaining to speech pathologists. How does someone, one, go about locating someone? And also, should they constantly have updated evaluations with a speech pathologist throughout the disease? Mm, that's a good question. So typically you need um, a doctor's referral. Um, I'm not sure how it works if you don't need referrals for your insurance. I would I would talk to um, they have the local area. Agency. Yeah, look at your insurance and if you could call around and just ask specifically for, you know, compensatory cognitive um, strategies for dementia and if they work on that. I mean, it's in our scope of practice, so we have to. Um, if you are fortunate enough that you could uh, uh, get home care, a home care speech pathologist coming into your home and being able to intervene at the home level, in my opinion, is ideal. If it has to be outpatient, that's okay, too. For the um, evaluation question, mm -hmm. it really depends. So our goal in, you know, thank goodness, insurance has kind of changed on this, but they used to want to see, you know, uh, improved, but really what we're trying to go for is maintenance. So if we can get the person to use, to, you know, maintain ability to recall information by using a calendar, we can work on that goal. Our main, our main responsibility is training the person to use the calendar um, or respond appropriately when cued to the calendar. So, um, you know, it's, it really depends. So I would think that if you saw a speech pathologist and then she determined, at least this is what I do when I'm doing home care is I, you know, we work with the most pressing needs. So I'll say, you know, what's most challenging? What are you doing, not doing now that you wish you could be doing? And say that's repetitive questions. So we get to a point where the person's repetitive questions are, are to a level that's not overwhelming to the caregiver, and maybe maybe they're gone entirely, um, depending on how effective the intervention was for that person. Um, and then I say, okay, well, it sounds like things are pretty well managed for now. If there are any changes, mm -hmm. call me, contact me. Um, you know, this may be different depending on your insurance, unfortunately. With the VA, veterans can get as much therapy as they want, as long as they have a goal to work on. We're not really restricted in that way. So, um, you know, I would, I would also talk with your clinician about, you know, what can I expect to see? Um, is there any way I could prepare for supporting when this person progresses further into the disease? Um, they should be providing you that education, but if not, don't be afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And it's always important, right, to check in with different things. And if you're calling your insurance, you can also call local chapters, as well as you can also touch base with the area agencies. Many ha caseworkers or places have worked with speech pathologists, so they also might know some ins and outs of that as well. And of mm -hmm. course, we have Dr. Bershnick's email just in case um, if you're in the same state. Mm -hmm. um, we do have someone who asked, and I'll, I'll have this as the last question, but they asked, um, so how do you work with um, patients in regards to medicine and behaviors? Medicine and behaviors. Yeah, they're specifically wow. asking about Aricept and Namenda, and I know, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. With medication, you need to specifically talk to your doctor, but I would say general approaches. Yeah, I, I mean, as a speech pathologist, I'm, I'm always aware of the medications just because, and typically this is caught before the person gets to me. So they, mm -hmm. you know, say, for example, I'm in a nursing home and the person is referred by, um, uh, you know, nursing, then they would have checked typically if the person had a UTI or if the person had some polypharmacy issues where a drug was interacting, was causing the cognitive issues. Um, and in that case, I wouldn't really have to take care of it, but it is something I'm aware of. 
in terms of those medications, they do help um, people in the earlier stages. However, they they don't reverse dementia or um, cure it. You know, mm -hmm. they, they do help for a temporary period and um, help the person maintain some functioning. But it, it's yeah, it's definitely not an area that I intervene on specifically. Mm hmm. Yes. And so I just want to wrap up with thank you with being here with us, Dr. Bershnik. You know, I just want to read some of the comments we've gotten from people because um, it's just quite remarkable, the information you've shared with us today. I have a few people saying thank you for such the great tips and info. Fantastic presentation. This has been the most clear relevant of any that they have been on. Um, thank you so much. This is helpful. Great preventative tips to try, very valuable information. So again, I wanna thank you for taking the time to be with all of us today. And of course, as Dr. Bershnik mentioned, if you have further questions, feel free to reach out to her as well as you can reach out to us at AFA. We can gladly connect you as well as provide you with resources. If you did have any difficulties downloading the handouts um, that Dr. Bershnik provided for us, you please feel free to email us and call us our helplines 866-232-8484 and we would be happy to get those to you so thank you again dr bushnick for being here with us today thank you my pleasure all right everyone have a great day and take care